And if you don't consider the people on the other end of your marketing, it's not going to do well. Like the best, the best marketing is authentic and it's fun and it's people focused because on the other end of your messaging is always going to be a person. And I was stressed and I was working every hour under the sun. And even though I was making great money, I was losing my relationships because I was working too much. And so yeah, it just came to a point where I was like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start my own business. And it's been an awesome experience. It, yeah, if it doesn't support your strategy. So getting getting clear on why you started your business, getting clear on your strategy and don't overcomplicate things uh, because you don't need every tactic and every and everything under the sun. You just need to do a few things and do it really well. Test, measure, then reassess and then start again. That Those are a couple of tips that I have, which I see across most of the businesses that I work with. Take some time to write down and articulate exactly why you started your business, what you want to achieve with it, what you want, how you want people to feel about your business. Uh, because when you get really clear on those types of things, it helps you firstly just like take stock and, and get excited about your business again. But secondly, it helps you with your business planning and your marketing planning. I feel like when you are working with a big organization, they sort of maybe care less about their staff because there's so many of you, it kind of doesn't matter. But the small businesses that I know, and certainly how I want to run my business, is to put our team members front and foremost as they're the most important asset that we have. Hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Today we are joined by one amazing Abby Gatlin. Abby, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm very excited to be here. And thank you for accepting our invitation. We love to meet with excellent and distinguished guests like yourself. (laughs) Oh, shucks. Stop it. You're making me blush. (laughs) (laughs) All right. No, that's quite interesting because I didn't expect a reply. I thought I'd be like, oh, no, that's perfectly fine. But wow. I'll tell you what, though. Let's just dive right into it because there are so many things for for us to discuss. And I'm pretty sure that the audience is quite intrigued about why we chose you to be a guest on the Boardroom Podcast. Yeah, as am I. (laughs) Oh, really? Well, if you don't know, then I won't know. But here's what. There's a question that we always ask every guest that comes on. Before I can ask that question, I must ask the preview. Or, well, it's like a precursor to that question. Where is your favorite city? Oh, my favorite city. It's a, it's a hard one because there are so many amazing cities out there. You know, last year I went all through Mexico and that was fantastic. I've traveled through Europe, but my heart lies where my family is. And so it's either Brisbane, Australia, or pretty much Dublin in Ireland. I will go to those two places. I've got family in other places as well, but those are my two top. I've heard good things about Dublin, actually. Yeah, so we're going to. No, not yet. I haven't yet been to Dublin, but I think it's somewhere that I definitely should make a priority to. A hundred percent. Architecture and culture and history and everything like that, right? Yeah, beautiful. And the people are just fantastic. You'll never meet friendlier people than the Irish. Are you sure about that? Oh, well, I could be you... proven wrong. <laughs> yeah, the, pe- the people that are the most, are the friendliest and the warmest that I've ever met are Brazilians and Mexicans in that uh, order. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So. Uh, the, every Mexican I met over there last year was just stunning. So friendly, kind-hearted, warm, open. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm happy to say there's quite a few friendly people out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the bad ones are right? a bit loud motive, so they make people have a bad name. Cool. Yeah. Interesting how that works. <laughs> but here's the question, though. So we, you and I, we're going to assume that we're in Dublin, Ireland. We're walking down the street in Dublin and I see one of my friends approaching. I decided to introduce you to my friend. So I say to my friend, friend, this is Abby. Abby, this is friend. When I introduce my friend to you and you've met friend, who exactly is friend meeting when he or she meets. Oh, wow. That's a mm. very <laughs> interesting <laughs> question. I love that. Uh, nice to meet you, friend. Uh, who are they meeting? Well, I hope they're meeting someone who's 
who's welcome and open and keen to meet them as well. I'm naturally curious, so I love meeting new people and finding out their stories, hence why I like being on podcasts. Um, but, you know, I genuinely kind of leave with the things that I love because that gives me gives people a good sense of who I am. I love my family. I love crisps, hence the name of my business, Crisp Communications. I love dogs and I just love people in general. So one, I found this thing the other day called conversational threading. Have you ever heard of that before? Yeah. It's, no, it's it might be. Go oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was going to say conversational threading is basically – uh, how to sustain a, a, a good, long and interactive conversation. And instead of just giving short answers or closed answers, you give answers with a little bit of detail that someone else can potentially relate to. So I find that if I go, oh, this is who I am and this is what I love and this is what I like to do, they'll the other person will find one of those things they'll cling on to because they're interested in that as well and they'll start a great conversation. So that's that's what I would say. <laughs> Sounds like you're a person that um, you do a lot of reading, a lot of learning. You also seem like a family-oriented kind of person. What what are crisps though? Are they like biscuits or, or oh. is it something? Else? <laughs> Potato chips. I'm from Jamaica, by the way. Oh, po- oh, oh, oh! Yes. I love potato chips. Is it like um, Doritos and so on, or is it better? yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm from a British and Irish family, and they call it crisps over there. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, well, potato chips, potato chips are are pretty good. I am. Um, yeah. I I approve of that name. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting though? A lot of times in life, and I'm pretty sure you can attest this. A lot of times in life, it's the simpler things that add the most happiness. So you don't necessarily need to have a mansion to be happy, but if you can have a home, it doesn't have to be the biggest, but with family nearby and everything. That's so much more valuable than being up in the hills by yourself with people you don't like in a big old mansion paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on taxes and so on. Quite interesting. So crisps, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, and I totally agree with you that, you know, family is so important. I, I'm actually one of mm-hmm. eight kids, so I'm from a very big family. Oh. I have family is just my number one value And so everything I do in life, I want it to be inclusive of them. I want to give back to them. I want to celebrate them. They're literally all my best friends. And, yeah, I can't imagine being hidden away up in the hills by myself and not being able to share it with them. So I agree with you there. Yeah, sounds good. And, I mean, if you're not a family-oriented person, I'm pretty sure there are people like that. Maybe they had um, a bad history or a bad upbringing. It's kind of hard for you to make it through tough times. I mean, you can have a very close group of friends. But you know, they say, in my country, they have this say that um, blood thicker than water. And what that means is that the family ties between blood is a lot stronger than the family ties or the friendly ties between friends that have sweat together or worked together or struggled together. So, you know, there's also that. I am a little bit curious about crisps because I've spoken about the chips, but you said you named your agency, your company, your business after crisps. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds it sounds crazy when I actually do tell people that. Um, they don't realize <laughs> that my logo is actually a crinkle cut crisp, so a crinkle cut chip. Oh. Um, <laughs> I uh, I started my business in um, 2019. It's a digital marketing mm-hmm. agency, and it came out of a place of I had been working in my career and just going crazy and just keeping my head down, bummed up on the career wagon. And I was just sort of feeling like devoid of fun and interest. And I just had no direction for where I wanted to be. But all I knew was that I didn't have enough creativity in my life. And so one thing led to another. And I decided to go crazy and just start my own business because I wanted to get creativity in my life every day. And I've been so sort of stifled in my career before launching my business. I was like, I'm going to make this 100% about everything that I love. So I called it Crisp Communications because of crisps, chips, but also because it's about, you know, nice, clean communication. I made it pink because I love pink. I put my dog on my website. I was like, I'm going to do everything to make this the absolute perfect business for me (laughs) and so that's where the crisps came from and um you mentioned that you 
did something as a job, a career before you started your business? What was that? And since you started Crisp's Crisp Communication, what has your experience been over the past four years, really? Oh, yeah, the past four years have been amazing. I I sometimes reflect on it and I wish I got here sooner. So I I kind of was always a creative person. And when I was, you know, finishing high school, I thought I was going to go into fine arts or graphic design or something in the artistic creative space. However, things sort of happened in school. I had a teacher who didn't believe in me and I got my creativity absolutely stifled out of me and (laughs) I was crushed I was crushed like a grape and so uh, it came to me finishing high school and I was like well I'm not going to do that anymore I'll just do whatever anyone tells me to and so someone said I'll become a teacher and I was like okay cool so uh, I was like it's a great career it's got lots of employability you know it's fantastic so I just went and I studied to become a teacher And then I realized, actually, that's not really the thing for me. So I switched over to, you probably can tell I like talking. So I switched over to doing workplace training so I could talk to more people. (laughs) I'm very subtle, I know. Um, So I ended up going down sort of like workplace training route and then I went into management and then I... Then I went into, I just was basically on the management train because it turned out to be quite good at managing. So I ended up getting bigger and bigger teams and bigger and bigger budgets. And I was stressed and I was working every hour under the sun. And even though I was making great money, I was losing my relationships because I was working too much. And Uh, so, yeah, it just came to a point where I was like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start my own business. And it's been an awesome experience. it's, you know, you have, you know, you're in a bad place when you think that starting your own business means that you'll have more time for yourself than being an employee. Wow. <laughs> <Wow. Don't, laughs> that's where I was. <laughs> so that, I mean, I was a, I was a little bit blindsided by that. Running your own business is very time consuming, but it's just been a fantastic experience because I have been able to be fully autonomous and in control and set the tone, set the pace, set the direction. It's such a wonderful feeling. That's um that's a powerful story because you mentioned that starting your own business meant that in your estimate at the time, you would have more time for yourself. Like I think about it a lot. And here's here's where my mind is. I'll, I'll just share my thoughts with you. Out of time on social media, I will come across posts from capitalists and entrepreneurs and business owners, and they will absolutely slam the nine to five drudgery, as they would put it. In terms of, they will make it appear that if you have a nine to five job, it's not the best thing you can do for yourself. And I don't understand that proposition because if having a job it's not good for someone, then how can you as the entrepreneur run a business? Otherwise, it's a solopreneur, it's a side hustle, it's you against the world and you're not going to get very far like that. On the other hand though, why is it that, as so I'm an entrepreneur, I was first an entrepreneur, then a talker, because here I'm on a podcast. <laughs> why is it that as entrepreneurs, we don't make it our prerogative or priority that whenever we have an excellent worker like yourself, wonderful, doing well in management, leading teams, managing the budget, getting stuff done, accountable, respectable, everything like that. We can count on you. Why is it that when we have workers like you, we don't make it our priority to take care of people like you? I mean, I'm pretty sure there are entrepreneurs that do that, but the stories of the horror stories are far more than a success story. So why do you think that happens really? Yeah, that is an interesting thing. I I certainly don't think that being uh, a business owner is any way you know, better than being an employee. It's different things for different exactly. people. But exactly. I, I, I mean, I certainly know that from my time in working for other people and I work for big organisations and the government and and big, big, big companies where mm-hmm. I'm one of thousands of employees, you know, I feel like when you are working with a big organisation, they sort of maybe care less about their staff because there's so many of you, it kind of doesn't matter. But the small businesses that I know, and certainly how I want to run my business is to put our team members front and foremost, as 
they're the most important asset that we have because because if you get a good team member then they will lighten your load they'll make you look better (laughs) why wouldn't you want to keep them around and support them and help them live their dream as well that's true and i think it hit the nail on the head when you said that it's a lot like um larger corporations have more people to manage so because of that each person weighs less than with a small business a team of 10 or 12 maybe so yeah i think that's um i think that's fair that's that's a good way to look at it uh you mentioned earlier because i want to backtrack a bit before we move forward you mentioned that you had a situation where a teacher crushed your creativity and now you're in the creative space believe it or not you're in the creative space and you're successful is it okay for you to just, you know, do you mind like sharing that story of how that teacher crushed your creativity and where you are right now? Because it's two parts. So the teacher crushed your creativity. But for where you are right now, based on what the teacher had said and done at the time, how do you feel about what you've achieved, really? So yeah. two parts. <laughs> yeah, I think I count myself so lucky that I have made it back into a creative role again. Um, because when that happened, so, you know, it wasn't the biggest thing in the world, but I was in Australia, the last two years of your high schooling, you're working intensively to get this final grade. And based on that grade depends on what course you can go into, what university you can get into. And basically if you don't get into the right thing, there's all this stigma around it and, it's a lot of a pressure to put on like a 17 year old, you know, anyway. And so I'd always consider myself to be creative. I did art throughout um, all my schooling and we got to the final half of our last, my last year of school and my teacher chain, the new teacher did not like me or my art whatsoever and failed me. And it was the first fail I've ever had in my life. I'm quite a studious person. I always try my best. And I'm lucky that I, you know, I stick with it and I keep going. But that absolutely crushed me because it actually shut the door on me being able to take a creative course at course. university. Mm-hmm. I know there are other ways I could have done. I could have done a bridging course, gone into another one and come back again. But I basically thought, and, you know, you're thinking about a teenager. You're so impressionable as a teenager. And um, community and the people around you are so important um, uh, they're so important to your self-worth and your self-belief. So me being told by this teacher that actually this thing that I always considered myself to be, this person, a creative person who achieved well, was also like, oh, no, no, you're not. That's not who you are. It put me into this absolute spiral because like, who am I if I'm not, if I'm not that, who am I? So yeah. <laughs> I don't think, think back about it now. I'm like, who cares? I felt I felt a, a course at school who cares there's bigger things in life now but that's retrospect in 2020 you know hindsight 2020 (laughs) so I uh, but it wasn't until I got into my career of you know I was probably seven or eight years out of university when I just was feeling you know that hollow feeling and I realized it was because I had no creativity in my life when that thing happened to me in high school I cut it out completely I didn't do anything I stopped painting, I stopped drawing, I stopped clay, I stopped everything. Mm -hmm. And I just closed that side of my life off and, Mm -hmm. you know, went on my way. And I was just like, well, this is me now. I'm a manager. I'm just going to go up the up the career train (laughs) and just make money. And it wasn't enough to sustain me. Uh, So I'm really, but, you know, going into starting my business, I thought that I had gone too far into my career. I thought I was making too much money. I couldn't go to the bottom and start again. I thought I was too old to learn skills. Everyone but younger than me had all these tech skills that I didn't have. I just had no self-belief that I could actually pivot, change my career completely. Um, but I knew that I wanted to. So when I decided that creativity missing from my life was the thing that was making me feel so down um, and I wanted to get to a creative space, I found every opportunity that I could to start to get creativity back in. And then after a while, that's when I was able to then start, take the leap and start my own business. There are many stories of the educational system just ringing and crushing the absolute life out of kids dreams and this was almost one of those stories 
you know the thing that's worth mentioning you pulled through but you pulled through in such a way that you denied yourself what your true passion was you did what you hated you didn't even liked or loved what you did you were good at it though but it wasn't your actual passion so there wasn't that it wasn't that love and desire and yearning for it and by doing that you got to a place where you would prefer you'd prefer to chase after those dreams that childish ambition that you had it's like a romantic film of some sorts where you grow up, you had this dream, you stopped chasing your dream. And a few years later, you wait with people you don't like doing something you don't love, making money. That's not enough. Well, I'm not saying that happened to you, but you know, that's a general plot. <laughs> and yeah. that's where you have this moment. Or, you know, like you're watching the cartoons and the bag of bricks falls down the building and absolute smacks the character in the head and this big bump grows. That's yeah. how the idea grows in your head. Ha. Huh? Maybe I should start my own business. And because you did that, it was never a teacher that was going to grade you. The market was going to grade you. So the yeah. teacher might have failed you for personal reasons, but now the market is giving you a passing grade because your business has been up for four years. So, you know, that's beautiful. And I respect that. Hats off to you. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to see that movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it sounds great. Oh, really? So you want to see a character get smacked in the head and a bum go? Or maybe <laughs> maybe we can send this script to Netflix. That would be our big break. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just in time That'll for all the Christmas dreaming. movies to come out. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, right? And then, you know, the hopeful romantics next year, yeah. looking to find the one. Yeah. You know what I should definitely look into? In terms of creativity, share with us a bit more what that means and how you use that to serve your clients because I'm quite interested about that. Yeah, I look, I think creativity is um there's so many different things. I mm-hmm. I love it and I love talking about it. I actually have my own podcast where I talk about creativity and unpack everyone's different versions of what it means to them and what it is and how it comes out in their lives. But for me, I think creativity is um, just allowing yourself to explore and um, <clears throat> ideate and um, invent and try and test and fail and, uh, you know, and sometimes that's also in an artistic way. It doesn't necessarily have to always be an artistic way, you know. A lot of uh, creative, my creativity, I think, is actually in problem solving. I'm not necessarily doing something creative, but I'm thinking laterally. I'm trying to solve a problem in a new and inventive way. Um, <laughs> and it, when a few people have actually said to me on my own podcast that, mar- you know, marketing is like the devil's work <laughs> and it's not a creative act. And I just completely deny that. I think that uh, marketing is. They've a never really- spent a day in marketing, have they? No, I think, I think being a business owner and doing marketing, they're two extremely creative acts because yeah. um, you've you've always got to be on the ball. You're getting all these different problems thrown at you. There's no clear cut answer. You've got to try things out. You've got to test it. Sometimes things fail. Sometimes they do really well. You got to pick yourself back up. You got to do it again. How is that not a creative act? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's um. That's the crux of the matter, because what I realized happened is that the way you think influences the solutions that you bring. The unique solution that you bring can be your UVP or your USB, unique value proposition or unique selling proposition. That could be your market share. That could be your business. That could be your profits and a roof over your head and food for your family to eat. But in terms of crisp communications, and what exactly does your company do? Though? Yeah, so we um, we offer digital marketing support. I like to consider ourselves that we're just like an extra team member for our clients. We we get in there, we run their strategies, we implement, we iterate, um, and generally they're for professional services businesses. So. Um, They're like uh, financial planners and accountants and lawyers, basically anyone with an intangible service, we support them. And in terms of the actual physical things that we do, uh, we build websites, we manage podcasts, we do graphic design, um, social media, basically anything that people see, hear, 
feel or read about you or your business, that's what we support mm-hmm. with. Branding and so on, copywriting, email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole shebang, you know. <laughs> that's a nice word. I like that word. Sounds fun. <laughs> and what what are what are some of the results that you've got for your clients over the years that are remarkable? I'd like to talk to us. About? Oh yeah, there's. I mean, there's so many cool results, and sometimes they don't have to be. You know, absolutely outstanding. A million you know, dollars from ten dollars. Yeah, no. Yeah, like you know, you might pitch a new course for someone and they sell out in the first go, and you're like, "That's great," but then you might just work with someone, That's brilliant. <laughs> and you solve a problem that they've been facing for ages. So, so many people come to us mm-hmm. and they go, "I have this whiz bang awesome website, but I just don't know how to use it myself." And so I hate it. I can't update it. I can't add to it. And so, you know, we solve that problem. We take away that issue for them by giving them a website that they can actually use. We train them on how to do it. We make it nice and simple. And those types of results I'm super happy with because you can just physically see the relief go off their face. They now have a tool that they can use and leverage uh, to help grow their business. Um, so, I mean, I'm never really about the numbers, like the money numbers. We do help our clients make money. I'm most proud of when we help people feel better, uh, love their business, get excited about their business, be proud of their business. Like so many people are happy that we help them put their best foot forward, then bring their brand to life and make them feel excited about it. That's a, those are the types of results that I just live for. That's um that's valuable work being done because if people feel empowered and excited to do business, especially small business owners, then you're impacting many lives right there. Because as you know, the small businesses move the community. You know, the small business is the is the one that's going to help build the park. They are going to hire that single mom or dad. They are going to be the one to give a summer job to a child in high school. They're the ones that really influence and impact the community. So if we can help small businesses on their way to success, then definitely we are making a huge impact on society. And that's why we started the Boardroom Podcast, because we love to connect with individuals, proud and exceptional individuals like yourself who have done something and can help small businesses on their journey to success. And what we want to do ideally, we've realized that A lot of times when businesses fail, it's because of a lack of knowledge, not because of a lack of resources. With creativity, you can make a lot from very very little. So that is why we're here. And we thank you for coming on. Being that you've worked with small businesses and you've become familiar with their problems and some solutions, what are some of the problems that you see small businesses create for themselves that ultimately could lead or have led to their destruction. And for those problems that they have created for themselves, what would you say is a better way that they could have gone about doing that thing or what is a solution that they could implement to solve those problems? It doesn't have to be like five. It can be like just three problems that you see them (laughs) happen. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think such a cool thing that you're doing with the podcast. So congratulations there. I think the more the small business community can come together and share this information, the better we're all going to be. So congrats. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. (laughs) So I guess like some of the problems that I see uh, when businesses come to me, I think the first one is that they've kind of lost sight of what their goals are. You know, the people we work with, they're usually like micro businesses, one to five staff members, but they've got high turnover. And they get so busy, so, so busy in their day-to-day that they lose sight of what they're doing it for, um, why they started the business in the first place, who they want to work with. So um, for that issue, I feel like just building a little bit of time into your day, uh, it doesn't have to be every day, once a month even, or once a year, where you just take some time to write down and articulate exactly why you started your business, what you want to achieve with it, what you want, how you want people to feel about your business. Uh, because when you get really clear on those types of things, it helps you firstly just like take stock and, and get excited about your business again. But secondly, it helps you with your business planning and your marketing planning. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's one of the first things I always see. And the second thing is uh, 
just when people over get people over complicate it you know we are so keen on improving all the time and keeping up with the joneses that we're watching and seeing what people are doing online we're like okay i've got to do that oh i've got to do that i've got to do that i've got to be on the latest thing i should be on threads now threads is a thing you know it, don't over it was a thing <laughs> it was a thing i know i feel like it's not a thing anymore yeah. but <laughs> but there's always a new thing and it's not necessarily going to stick around so there's no point jumping on the latest bandwagon yeah if it doesn't support your strategy so getting getting clear on why you started your business getting clear on your strategy and don't overcomplicate things uh because you don't need every tactic and every and everything under the sun you just need to do a few things and do it really well test measure then reassess and then start again that those are a couple of tips that i have which i see across most of the businesses that i work with so they're going after the shiny object and they are causing their own demise by not being focused and stuff like that so test measure reassess and go again that that was what you said yeah yeah so you've got your strategy and a strategy is only as good as as where you actually you know measure the results of it and then you see the results and you go, I had this goal for my strategy. Let's reassess. Is that still my goal? Or is my goal changed now? Maybe that's not so important. So if there's still the same goal, you can just pretty much implement the same strategy again. But if it's not, you might need to tweak your strategy. You might need to pivot into a new direction. Or you might also go, hey, we, we're still doing too many things. We probably need to reduce it down again. Because if you're doing too many things, you'll never get anything done. Yeah, and the thing about it is that sometimes you have to realize that less is more. I'm going to ask you a pop question. It's like a trivia. And okay. And then I'll give you the answer. <laughs> and this is going to... So the hint to the answer is that sometimes less is more and the new shiny object isn't always the best. Do you know which marketing channel offers the highest return on investment across all media? Oh, I don't know. I feel like it changes mm. all the time. I think Facebook oh. Facebook ads seems to be getting a good return at the moment. LinkedIn is doing extremely well, but it's really expensive to get in and to get your ads on there. True. You have to start at like $50 a day, I think. Mm-hmm. <coughs> it also depends on your industry and your business. <laughs> true, true. So if you're, not, um, if you're not B2B, then you might have some issues using LinkedIn. Um, so you have either Facebook or LinkedIn as the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think at the moment, yes. Uh, I, I think well, it depends. Like if you're selling a product, then Instagram is the way to go. Mm-hmm. If you are, if you are in the sort of early early twenties market or the teens market, TikTok is fantastic. But the, for the people that I deal with, the businesses that I work with, professional services, Facebook mm-hmm. and LinkedIn are the way to go. And also your Google profile. Claim your Google profile. Use it as a social media tool. You can post on there, and a lot of people don't know that. You mean Google My Business? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Google My Business is actually pretty good, especially for local SEO. Yeah, so I before I answer, guys, I want you guys to comment in the to comment below. Which marketing media do you think, I don't Google it, which marketing media offers the highest return on investment? So while you pause the video and comment, I'm just going to go ahead and give the answer right now. It's actually email marketing. Oh, I didn't. That didn't oh. even cross my mind. But yeah, you're so right. Emails forty-four yeah. to one. So for every dollar you put into email marketing, on average, you're gonna get back forty-four. You're supposed to get back forty-four dollars, and that yeah. can be so much more depending on the price of the item that you're selling. So if it's i tickets items, then you can make way more than forty-four dollars on the dollar. It's actually mm. email marketing. Mm. And how long has been has email marketing been around? Since like the 1990s. So that's awesome. It's not always about the new shiny object. Sometimes it's about what's tried, proven, and actually works. Oh, that's why you said that before. Sneaky. Uh, I like it. <laughs> Brilliant. So what, so what we do at Zellhab, whenever we're working with a client, we always prioritize growing an email list. Even if they don't work with us long term, If we're just delivering a website, we're always going to have lead generation integrated, always going to have something integrated like MailChimp or ConvertKit or ActiveCampaign, something to start growing their email list once they go live. Because 
the thing that we always have to remember is that when you're running a small business, 99% of your problems are going to be solved with making more money. If you can find a way to make money more consistently and more profitably, then you're going to be running a thriving and growing business 99.5% of the time. The other half percent is going to be COVID-19 and we don't know what happened. And funny enough, if you were making money consistently, then you probably would make it through COVID as well. So <laughs> I had to throw that in. Yeah. And hopefully we'll never see anything like that again. Touch wood. <laughs> Knock on wood. Yeah. I tell you what, though, you have a podcast. I would like for you to share with us a bit about your podcast because we can assume safely that if someone is watching or listening to this podcast, the boardroom podcast, then they might be into podcasting. So what is your podcast about and why did you get started? Yeah, well, I uh, it's called Creativity Uncovered. I actually only launched it this year. I think I launched it in maybe May this year. And mm -hmm. it came out of... You know, I said before that I was seeking creativity with my business and I got to the point mm -hmm. last year where I was having to be creative all day, every day, on demand, and that brought a whole nother problem. So actually being able to refill my cup and and stay creative became my problem last year because every time a client comes to me, you've got to have an idea, you've got to be able to implement quickly, you got to you know, it's just basically on demand. And so last year I was feeling a bit burnt out and um, I had a conversation with my brother um, who is a games designer and he's one of the most creative people I've ever met in my life. And I was asking him, just picking his brains about like everything that he does and how he comes up with these ideas and how they iterate and, and how do they manage the team and just, and I just asked him every question under the sun. And then at the end of it, I was like, oh, I feel great. I feel like I need to go out and do something. I was just so excited. And so I realized, oh my gosh, my creative funk is gone because I've had this conversation about creativity. I need to build more of this into my life. <laughs> so I came back and I started the podcast, Creativity Uncovered. And it's basically my excuse to talk to different people across the world about creativity and um, different industries, different walks of life, how they use it at home, at work, at play. And um, we basically just talk about how they unlock ideas, how they use creativity in their everyday life. And hopefully we will share some tips on how people can bust through creative blocks or discover new ways to be creative if they think they aren't a creative person. So that's kind of the podcast in a nutshell. And how often do you post episodes? Where can we find your podcast to listen? Is it watchable, like on YouTube as well? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I it's uh, it's mostly on streaming platforms at the moment, Spotify and Apple. It's on Google Podcasts, but that is disappearing soon. So don't bother going there. Um, <laughs> um, wow, I, I post. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. There's a recent update from Google. They've changed everything. But anyway, um, I did start off doing fortnightly because this is just a little side project to to keep me interested and excited. But I've had so many people come out of the woodwork and want to discuss their creativity with me. I have done so many episodes. I've actually had to go to weekly, um, <laughs> and so. I think I'm up to like my 21st episode already and it's only launched a couple of months ago. Um, but yeah, you can grab it from my uh, website, chriscoms.co forward slash podcast, um, or you can just Google Creativity Uncovered and it comes up on Google or Spotify or Apple. Sounds good. Sounds beautiful. So we do have a podcast going where you share information. In your podcasting journey so far, and learning from others, getting their message out there. What are some of the most important lessons for creative success that you've learned so far? I imagine that as the host, you've learned quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Look, I've learned so much. And I think what's what's been most interesting to me is that um, there is this common language around creativity that everyone kind of seems to speak of almost unknowingly. Um, and one thing that is really interesting to me is that a lot of people have mentioned the concept of seasons, seasons in your life and seasons in creativity. 
and and how that emulates nature's seasons. And so, uh, you know, and it's it's kind of like in this season of your life, you might be really focused on your job and creativity to succeed, but then in the next stage, creativity is the thing you need and your job is not as important and then the next season might be your family and how it's okay to dip in and dip out of it um, because seasons are cyclical and you'll always come back to it and I think that's kind of one of the most eye-opening things that I have Mm -hmm. heard about on the podcast. I love that. I will tell you why I love it. You know when you're so last week, yes it was last week wasn't it? We had a talk with a wonderful gentleman, a gentleman by the name John James Santangelo, Dr. John James Santangelo. And his episode is going to come out in a short few short days. And after that, I spoke with a personal coach, um, Mayoko Taylor. And the thing that Dr. James, San, Dr. John James Santangelo and um, Mayoko Taylor were saying is that, so Dr. John James Santangelo works in NLP, that's Neuro Linguistic Programming. And what that means is basically in a nutshell, what they're saying, I won't go into the specifics until the episodes are out. They're saying that the thing that you focus on at the moment is what you, right? So if you're focused on success, then you will become successful. And if you're focused on all the things that are going wrong, then things are going to keep going wrong because that's what you're focused on. By beholding, we become, says the Bible. The reason why I bring this up is because, you know, sometimes you're going through a rough patch in life. So it is at that point. So you need to... You have a baby on the way, God bless you, but you don't feel like you're making enough money. So you're focused really on improving the business, focused on getting a promotion because you want to make more money to take care of your child. The promotion comes through, business picks up, you're making some more money and that need is met. You're not going to be focused on that anymore, are you? You're going to be focused on the child. Once the child gets here, he or she's going to need a bit of nurturing going to need time, support, love, care, and all the good stuff that comes. And eventually that child is going to grow up and become independent and start to find their own identity in this world. And once that happens, you're going to need to focus on something else. All right, maybe I should start focusing on retirement or a second child or whatever the case might be. So what you've said just now is something that I resonate with. And I think there's some merit to that. And the idea is that, and this is just for me wrapping up on that point, in my own words, It's like saying to us that when we're going through a moment, when we're in a moment that might seem difficult for whatever reason, or it might even seem good, just remember that it's fleeting. It's not there forever. So do what you need to do to get through that moment and then go on from there. Is that like the lesson that we should learn from? Or am I just um, postulating at this stage? (laughs) I mean, postulate away. I love it. But yeah, I, I think that's true is because that is the nature of seasons is that it doesn't stay one season forever. It will, it's that by its nature, it will move on to the next at some point. So a hundred percent, I think that's a good way of looking at it. If you are going through a rough patch or, uh, or perhaps you're not as paying as much attention to this little thing that you want it's not going to be like that forever um mm-hmm. and I, but i thought like the link back to nature and creativity was just an interesting thing because we are one of the only types of beings that that are creative um you know animals aren't creative they they don't go and make art and <laughs> do any artistic endeavors i mean some some of them do sing but do they sing like tunes yeah, like it's just there's something we are so connected to nature as humans and and cr- nature is a creative thing, so therefore we are creative as well. Oh, just interesting. There's so many interesting things that come out of these conversations. <laughs> yeah, I think that psychologically as well what sets us apart is because we have the ability to think abstract, think about abstract ideas. So, for example, love, pain, fear, hate, darkness, light, hunger, greed, etc. So you see, because we can think about those things, yet again, by beholding you become, because you can think about those things, you can find a creative way to express them that others of your own species, we're going biological right now, others of your own species can relate to that, which is why it it it, it grinds my gears that that teacher failed you in art. How can a teacher fail you in art in high school if art is about expressing yourself in a way that feels natural to you? 
I'm, maybe there to, is an art teacher. Go ahead. I've I've had to come to come to peace with the whole thing, but that that is what I don't. I mean, that was one of the things that really was so upsetting at the time. Is is that I had been progressing through and doing really well, and mm-hmm. art is such an expressive thing. Uh, as long as you can articulate why you've done that and you have sound reasoning, it can't be bad art. But that's mm-hmm. a whole nother story. I'll never un- fully understand why that happened. But all I can say is I've moved on and I'm in a better place now. <laughs> I am with, yeah, that's like having that breakup message. Yeah. It's not me, it's you actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, you know, though, on. On the topic of breakups and relationships, we realize that in business, a lot of the things that makes the business click, they're going to have the people, they're going to have the system. And without the people, the system is useless because, I mean, who's going to work the system, right? And you seem like such a wonderful person. You even mentioned that in your stint in management, you did wonderfully. And I would love to ask for your humble opinion, your review, your feedback, on what are some of the things that we can do as small business owners that will help us to connect with our employees and our customers, our clients even more. Because those there are people, and at times they do get caught up in the numbers and the analytics and delivery. But what can we do as entrepreneurs, business owners, to make that connection with the people we work for and we work with? Mm, I think you answered it in your saying, in, your, in what you just said then, is about mm. the people. And Ooh. I think that we're... Businesses can come undone when uh, your marketing fails, when team members Mm. leave, when you have a Mm. bad culture. It's all because you've taken the eye, the eye, your eye off the most important thing, and that is the people. Um, it's, It's the same with managing a team. If you don't look after your people, then they won't look after you. And if you don't consider the people on the other end of your marketing, it's not going to do well. Like the best, the best marketing is authentic and it's fun and it's people focused because on the other end of your messaging is always going to be a person. Sometimes it might be a robot. I don't know. AI is doing a lot of things <laughs> these days. Can I tell you? <laughs> yeah. But, but it should be person to person. Uh, and that, that also goes for using AI, actually. Like if you're going to use um, chat GBT or wherever else to write your messaging, um, great place to start. But you need to make it authentic to you. You need to make it in your tone of voice. Uh, because if you just use exactly what is done, what is written for you by these robots, then it's not mm-hmm. going to connect to people in a human, authentic way. Uh, yeah. So I think... The, my my advice for any small business um, is to, if you're having any issues, is generally that you've taken the, um, you've just not focused enough on the people in any part of that situation. The people, as you're saying, are the most important part of all of the equation. And if you focus on the people, you'll get the other part right. You know, you know what's interesting though. I spoke to Bernard Chung. He's a billionaire actually, and I asked him about his secrets for business success. By the way, I'm going to link that episode somewhere here, guys, so you can watch it. And when I spoke to him about it, one of the things that he first said that he did that helped him to be so successful as an investor and as an entrepreneur is that he said that starting, starting a business, he always does business with people that he trusts, all right? And not only that, he doesn't do things to jeopardize their growth, So some of them might need a little bit more help than others. Others might need a lot more help. And unless it's needed, it doesn't necessarily give them money. What he does, he gives them, what he does is he gives them um, knowledge and wisdom and lessons on how to solve their problems. The reason why I bring this up is because I'm learning more and more that it's the people that we should focus on. And I know it sounds cliche because I just said that, but here's why I say that. I'm from Jamaica, all right? From Jamaica. And if you're in Jamaica and you're doing business, one of the surest way to get customers or clients is by offering excellent customer service. Why is that? Customer service is terrible. I've heard stories of, let's say, for example, I was told a story last week that there was a charge on someone's utility bill. Shout out to the dogs. There was a charge on someone's utility bill. (laughs) 
and it was a wrong charge. Their bill was up 300% in one month. They reached out to the utility company and were like, hey, what's happening? This isn't right. Would you believe that they hung up on them mid-call oh. and didn't solve their problem and tried to force them to pay that bill? So, I mean, people are important. Getting along with people are important, but this is where it's going to get difficult. It's going to be a difficult question. If people are so important, getting along with people is so important in business, how do we do it when the most complex person that we're ever going to interact with is ourself and other people? That's perhaps the most complex problem we're going to solve because everybody comes with something else. Personality, idea, thoughts, way of doing things. How do we get it right? Like, What are some of the things that we do to build that trust and relationship and bond and that good blood, as I would put it? Mm, getting deep with your questions. They, <laughs> this might be more <laughs> outside my area of expertise, but <laughs> from my experience. There from we my go, experience, from your experience. <laughs> that's all I can speak from, really. I'm not an expert in this field at all. But I just find that if you just come with an open mind, no sort of fixed idea of what the outcome is going to be but with an open mind to have open communication and curiosity leading that conversation and of course being polite (laughs) that always works um then you're just going to get the best out of people you know like i think there's a lot of pressure i feel as um leaders business owners managers that we have to know everything and we have to have the right answers and we have to solve all the problems, but mm-hmm. we don't, you know, we, if you, if you are having a uh, client experience issue and someone is angry with something, don't feel like you have to jump in and solve it straight away. Just open and listen and hear them out. People want to be heard um, and ask them how do you think we could solve this problem? They'll have a solution for you. It may not be the one that you go with, but <laughs> but don't feel like you have to jump in and solve every single problem. Um, just be open, open-minded about the conversation. And I find that generally works for me. So open-minded, honest, give others a chance. And um, you're familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk? Oh, yes. Gary V. Gary V, what well, guy... We should have him on the podcast. That's what we should do. So one of the <laughs> things that he always says is that you should be empathetic. And I think that's also a good thing. As you know, marketing is emotional. It's direct. It's personal. So um, speaking to their core desires, that's something that works in marketing. I think that would work when we consider interacting with people as well. Because you know when you have an engaged worker, someone who's committed to the cause, your business does so much better than when someone just shows up to make money. And how do you get them engaged? Well, you make them feel valuable and appreciated. Mm. So yeah, that's some solid ideas right there. And and that's certainly the way that, you know, in my previous job, thankfully I do not have very many angry people in my current business, but in my mm-hmm. previous jobs, in my previous career, I was dealing with a lot of angry people. That was just the nature of my role as a manager, disgruntled people and, you know, people who just weren't happy with the outcome. And I... I don't think I ever truly had a bad conversation because I didn't go in there with my backup. I didn't go in there really emotional. I didn't go in there with a really set idea of what the outcome was going to be. I just kind of followed that process of being open, um, empathetic, as you said before, listening to them, uh, making them feel heard. Um, And then you can sort of kind of, calm down any situation and both leave on good terms if you just approach conversations like that it's not a win or lose situation it's an understanding each other situation yeah absolutely and it's when you when they have that sort of combative yeah win win or lose situation that that's not good for anyone (laughs) that's not good even outside of business that's not good it should never be about i'm winning you're losing it's it, mm-hmm. if you can try and get my way or the of, highway yeah yeah like that's always going to end badly that's always going to end badly i think um dr jordan peterson said the same thing and it's not even about business actually we're speaking about relationships he said that whenever you're in a relationship you want to want it to be a situation where it's you and your partner that 
are solving a problem together. It's not me fixing you, you fixing me, my way or the highway. That sort of thing. It's not about me being right and you being wrong or anything. Because when you when you get to that stage, you know, you get to a place where you're gonna have a defeated partner, and that's no good. That's it. Always said that. He said that's no good. So I mean, if you're in a workplace and you don't feel respected and appreciated by your boss and your coworkers, then eventually you're gonna check out, and that's where pilferage comes in and um, time stealing and showing up late and leaving early and stuff like that. That's where you hang up on a support call with a disgruntled customer because their utility bill is up to hundred percent in one month. But I am yeah. cast in stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, there's definitely a backstory to that. Like, as you said, you you just don't go up, go on hanging up on people unless there was a lot of steps that led to that in the first place. There we go. I am, I have enjoyed today. Today was really a good talk. Very calm. Very fun, actually. I had a bit more witty than I normally am. So that was pretty good to have. How <laughs> did you enjoy your time on the Boardroom Podcast today, Abby? Oh, I think this was fantastic. I really um, want to thank you for reaching out and inviting me on. It was so great to meet you. And I feel like we spoke around the world <laughs> so yeah. many different topics today. But it's just great. I love talking to other business owners because I think sharing is caring and we can learn so much from each other just through these types of conversations so thank you and keep up the good work that is so true Uh, and thank you for being on as well it is our tradition whenever we have a guest on so we have a few traditions and they've had a good time we've spoken they've had a good time our audience members enjoyed them we like to ask them a very simple question given your time on the podcast today who is one guest that you would love to see on the podcast in the future? And when you tell us this guest, we're going to try to get them on. For this guest, what is one question that you would like us to ask them for you so that they can answer? Oh, there'd be so many people mm. that I'd love for you to have on the podcast just because I want to eavesdrop on the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fine uh, yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned Gary V before. That would always be a, a really interesting conversation. Uh, and if you were to get Gary V on, I want you to ask him, how does he do it? He is doing so many things and he has so much energy and he's running everywhere and filming his like live videos. And how does he have that much energy all the time? Because I want to I wanna know what his secret is. <laughs> so ask him that one for me. I think that's something that we should do. I would definitely love to get Gary V on. I, th- I feel like that is something we should make our priority. Find Gary V, reach out to his team invite him on and have a wonderful chat and ask him how does he manage to get so many things done at such high energy levels consistently for years decades mind because he's been doing this for quite some time it's just Mm. now that we're starting to see his content and starting to build affinity with it so that's um that's a good one yeah can i ask who's who who if you who would be your dream guest on the podcast do you have a list of people who you would just just die to have on the podcast apart from me obviously a list, a list of people that i would love to have on the podcast all right yeah. i'm not going to be looking at camera because i'm i'm going through my memory yeah simon sinek patrick bet david warren buffett jeff bezos elon musk um dr jordan peterson definitely gary v jim run is not alive so i can't get him but i would love to get brian tracy alex armosi um, I'm missing somebody. Mm. Dr. Roberta Kialdini, because I've read many of his books. Love them. There are quite a few people. I have a list, actually. Yeah, But right good. off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, because um, what you've done, you've put it out there now. And mm-hmm. I, I find if I ever say something I want to achieve or I've got post-it notes mm-hmm. up on my wall of the things I want to achieve, they happen. Mm-hmm. So now you've said that list, I trust it's going to happen. What I should do is I should cut out this part of the episode as well. Not like remove it, but like make a small clip, post it up on our YouTube and say, this is a note to the future. And then we'll get all those guests on. We take them off one by one and we'll say, ah, yes, we've achieved it. That would be Love awesome. It. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Can I tell you? Thank you for a wonderful time today, Abby. You've been wonderful, excellent, very interesting, entertaining, 
and we had a good time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Cheers. We'll be in touch. Take care.